And we're on part two of our series about humbling ourselves under God's hand. Okay, so under God's hand, living in grace and victory. We began this last week, and we're going to continue. Uh, Pastor Renee will be speaking next Sunday, and then I'll finish up this very short series uh, the week after that on, uh, on February 11. So, Caleb said, Amen. He will be one year old in, 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 in about a week, right? Six to, in 5th of February, see? I don't always remember all the birthdays, but important ones sometimes I get. Amen. We turn this morning to the word of the Lord. We want to live in grace and victory, don't we? Amen. We do. We do. And God's word shows us how we may live in grace and in victory. James and Peter in the New Testament tell us how and the key there are many things but there's a key and we find it in 1 Peter 5:5 5, 5, and in James 4:6 so we look at the two I've included part of the passage and we see in verse 5 and we see in verse 6 and don't worry he's small don't worry about him okay he can he, he'll learn don't worry about it we'll keep our focus this way okay um, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. This is a, uh, uh, taken from the Old Testament. And the Holy Spirit inspires Peter and James to say this as well. It, it encourages me as I look at this, um, and it gives me hope for myself. And I hope it, it should give you hope for yourself as well. Because if anybody could have, of the New Testament writers, if anybody could have had some place for pride, uh, James could have because this is the James that as far as we know who's the half-brother of Jesus the Lord Jesus himself you know and he writes about humbling yourself submitting yourself so this is James Peter as we talked about in the first service of all of the disciples no joke of all of the disciples if any of the 12 disciples had a problem with pride again and again and again who was it our brother Peter for sure for sure I mean throughout it's true throughout the whole thing he had a problem with pride he, he was he wanted to be better than well not just he wanted to be he thought he was better than all the others he thought I'm not all oh, they'll all fail and desert you but not I oh Lord and he's the that's true and he's the he's the one he's the one that fell and what encourages me as we look at this about humbling ourselves and when we humble ourselves receiving grace and living in victory is that the Holy Spirit who could have chosen anybody to write about this he chose James and Peter and in Peter who writes about being humble we see someone who has learned this this way of living as a Christian that's not such an easy way to live always so that encourages me for myself and it should encourage you for yourself as well so both of these say God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble and then they both explain a little bit further James we'll get to this this morning James adds something here when he says submit yourselves to God but it's all in the same vein of humbling yourself before the Lord and Peter says specifically humble yourself under God's mighty hand and that's what we're going to be looking at primarily this morning about humbling ourselves under God's hand and when we do that and as we do that the resulting grace that we will receive and the victory and the favor in which we will live as Christians it's very very clear strong scriptural foundation for us in this as we look at it so here the key is God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble it's important to God and because it's important to God, it should be important to us as well. It, it is. And God the Holy Spirit, fully God, inspired these two to say exactly the same thing and to write in detail about it so that we might grasp this key for overcoming successful Christian living. I really, I really mean that. I hope, I hope we see that and get that. God opposes or he pulls against or he resists any spirit of pride because as we said last week pride is what made Lucifer Satan pride was the first sin in heaven and pride was the first sin on earth as well 
you say, but no, I thought it was, you know, just disobedience. Eve ate the apple. You go back and look and you read. The root of it was pride. If you eat, you'll be like God. Woo! I'll be, that's right, it's pride. I'll be like God. Rather than depending on what God said, don't eat. Don't eat. I can eat. I can do this. Oh, and brothers and sisters, though we have no tree of life literally in front of us from which to eat or not eat, from which to choose one way or the other, nevertheless, you and I, every day, every day, we have the same choice Adam and Eve had. We have the same choice. How are we choosing? How are we choosing? If we are living in pride, if we have a root of pride in us that we're willing to let stay there and not dig it up with the Holy Spirit's help, we are going to lose this battle and God is going to oppose us. He's going to oppose us. He's going to resist us. He's not going to give us the grace that we must have if we're going to live an overcoming, victorious life. Peter, in this passage, and I've told you last week and I tell you again, in your own devotions, in your own meditation, go back to James chapter 4. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 5 and meditate. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. He describes that victorious life and it is a life that is a humble life under the Lord. It is a life in which the devil will run from you. I want the devil to run from me this year. I do. I do. The devil will run from you. You will have extra grace and we must have grace and you will be lifted up and strengthened and established and be made firm. Peter does not say you will have no trouble this year if this is how you live. In fact, he says we're going to go through some tough times. We are. But in those tough times, which by the way, everyone is going through. Peter makes it clear. I didn't include it in the whole passage, but he'll say, he, he says, the one, you, your brothers around the world, your brothers everywhere are going through these things. We're going to go through some of these things. But brothers and sisters, we are going to go through with the grace of God and we're going to overcome. We're going to be victorious. We are not going to be overcome by evil. We're not going to be overcome by the devil. We are going to overcome. And the key is here. The key is here, and so we want it. We want that key in our hands, and we want to turn the key so that we have this in our lives. And so God says, I oppose what is proud. I oppose the proud, but if you will humble yourself, I'm going to give you grace. Does God say this because He's mean? He's hard? He wants us to be under His hand? No. But God will never bless in us what caused Lucifer to fall, and what broke fellowship with Adam and Eve and God Himself. He'll never honor that. He'll never bless that in our lives. He'll never give grace to that because that will destroy us. That will limit us. That will hinder us. And so that's why God tells us flat out, plain words. He says, I'll oppose what is I oppose the proud, but I'll give you grace if you're humble. I'll give you grace. And so it's simple. It's simple. Our enemy, the devil, wants us to live independently because that's how he was and that's how he is. I don't need to submit to God. I can do it my own way. I can whatever. But God says, depend, submit, humble, and then I'm going to give you grace. We talked last week about the voluntary humbling and we talked about fasting, and fasting is always related to, to humbling in the, in the Bible. We, you, you go through the Bible. David said, um, I humbled myself through fasting. Ezra said, uh, we, by the Ahava Canal, we're going to look at Ezra today, this Old Testament scribe. This Old Testament, and we're going to, we're kind of thinking, some of you are probably thinking he's this dusty old guy, must have been really a boring man, you know, all he did was study all the time and whatever. We're going to find out about him today. Um, but Ezra said, I, 
I, we, we proclaimed a fast and we humbled ourselves to, to call on God. Daniel said, Daniel received this vision of the end times and what was yes, yet ahead. Things that you and I need for our lives today. He didn't understand it. So what did he do? He humbled himself and fasted and prayed. And because he did that, he received revelation. Because he received revelation, you and I today have understanding about the end times. Because Daniel did that all the way back then, all the way back there. Uh, sorry, Pastor Renee, I, we turned that up earlier because it was hot. If it gets really, really cold, the fan is on high now, just, just to let you know over, over this way. And so we see this, this voluntary humbling through fasting. I'm going to go ahead and tell you something right now. Some of you are saying, oh, rats, I didn't fast, so I've missed out. We're going to look at some things this morning that will help us in this area because there are some other basic ways of Christian living that have to do with humbling. But I want to tell you something right now. If you want a head start, you want to jump ahead a little bit, you want to go to the front of the class in this, if you look at the Old Testament, and you look at the New Testament, you look at the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus along with these Old, Testaments, Old Testament examples, you will see that there are three very strong things. And one of them in the life of Jesus himself was fasting, was prayer, a dependence on prayer. And I, I, I tell you this this morning, when we don't have time, to, I, I know sometimes we get really busy, but when we don't have time to pray in general, when our lives are characterized by prayerlessness, okay, as, as a character, and when our lives are characterized by lack of giving and tithing, and some of you are going to mm, I tell you, it's scriptural, it's in the Bible, there's a good example, and we'll talk about this. In these areas, you see it in the life of Jesus himself. You see it in his teaching. These are some basic things. These are some basic ways that we humble ourselves. Um, let me just go ahead and just say a little bit before we go on, and it's not in my notes, but it's really been in my heart. For example, in the area of giving. Sometimes we talk with people, and, and a lot of people, and you say, oh, you're, you're just saying that because maybe the church needs. Uh-uh. No. We need it. We need it. Some people say, well, I, 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 it's my money. Ooh, ooh, what does the Bible say? When you're in the land and you say, my strength has gotten this for myself, be careful not to forget. Remember that I'm the one that gave you strength to do this. That's what, that's what God says. That's what God says. Or sometimes we will say, and it doesn't seem like pride, sometimes we'll say, I can't. I can't give. I can't tithe. I don't have enough. I've got to whatever. May I say to you that that is also a root of pride? Because what that mean, what that what we're saying is, God, I can't depend on you. I have to depend on myself. I have to depend on what I have. That's a root of pride. That's a root of pride. And I don't say that in... I'm saying, we need this, brothers and sisters. We want the grace of God in our lives. And we'll talk about this more in the months ahead. But that's just a head start for us. Amen? That's a head start for us. So we come back to this, and we turn again to our main text. It's in 1 Peter 5, but you go again to uh, James later on on your own. And we see this passage. Uh, here, are the, here are the positives and the negatives. Here, are, here again is our key passage. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. We humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. And we've been talking about this being under God's hand. Um, humbling ourselves under him and it's a choice brothers and sisters it's a choice now some of you are saying I'm under God's hand and it doesn't feel like a choice right now it's really heavy and I'm really being pressed we're going to talk about that the next time we come back to that we're not going to talk really about that this morning but I think sometimes in this as we began to talk about last week we so often take our er earthly understanding of being under somebody's hand and we take it over into the spiritual in the wrong way. And we think of maybe a big brother or maybe a big sister, because big sisters can be kind of mean sometimes too, right? I don't know if Julie was a mean big sister or not. I, I don't know if she was. She was. She, she's a big sister. But we, we kind of get the idea of somebody who is over us in power or over us in position and they're pushing us down. And that's the wrong way to look at the hand of God, because first of all, we choose to be there. 
we choose to be there. I'll tell you right now, any time in your life that you say, God, I don't want this. Do you know what God will say? It's up to you. Okay. You don't want it? Live your life without my hand. God will, God will honor our choice. God will honor our choice. He loves us and He will draw our hearts to Him, but He honors our choice because God gave us our will so that we could choose, so that you could choose, so that I could choose. I can choose if I want to humble myself or not. Oh, what a great God we have, brothers and sisters. He could have made us. He could have made us, but He never has. He gave us this precious gift we choose with our wills. And He says to us in love, choose me. Choose me. Choose to humble. Choose to humble. It's the best place you can be. I'm not going to push you down in the mud and the dirt where you are just, oh, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. That's not how God does it. And there's some examples for us in the Bible, and we want to look at those this morning. You don't have to be afraid of the pressure of God when His hand is upon you. We talked about Jacob last week. Because His hand is not only a hand of protection. Look at some Old Testament examples. And it's, it's, uh, look in Psalms. This is what David says. Next slide. We look in Psalm 91, 4, and David says, you say, wait, 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 Pastor Jennifer, it doesn't say hand anywhere. You're right, it doesn't, but it's the same thing. It's the same meaning. Look at what David says. He says, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. Now, I'm a country girl, and I remember going to my grandmother's house. Granny had a chicken house, a, a, a chicken coop or as we would call it, with a whole bunch of chickens and one rooster. And I was, I was scared of the rooster because he was mean. Um, but I was scared of the chickens too because sometimes they were a little bit mean. But she'd have, she, and she would, she would go out there and then most of the time she would collect the eggs. And she would, that's, those were the eggs. We didn't go to park and shop and buy eggs. We, she, she, all her eggs came from the chickens that she raised herself. And then every once in a while she would let some of the eggs hatch. Now, all of you who have been around a chicken yard before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. All those little chicks just running all over the yard, right? Or all over the, we, we've seen that, running all over. Until a dog barks, woof! Or until a hawk flies overhead, or something like that. What do all of those little chicks do when it seems like danger is near? What do they do? Shoo! Where do they run? They run to the mother. What does the mother do? The mother. I don't even know how they get all. How they all get under there. Do you? Yes, they do. If it, it, you're right, they do. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? But the mother covers them all. Nobody's left outside in danger. The mother covers them all. Now that's the picture, and I like that, isn't it? It's such a natural example. That is how David describes God for you and for me. And so I love that picture when we think of the hand of God upon us because that is what David is also talking about. It's not just a, oh, the mighty hand of God. There's a protection there as well. There's a care there as well. And then the second one, Psalm 57, 1. He get, again, what does he say? Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy. I look to you for protection. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Until the danger. And I love that picture also because sometimes you and I think it's safe, right? It's safe to come out. But the one who can see everything knows it's not safe yet, right? And keeps the, keeps the feathers, keeps the wings over. Because the one who watches over knows when it's safe. And that's how our God is for us as well. And so I ask you to think of the hand of God upon you in a different way if you haven't thought of it in that way. Does that help a little bit if you haven't thought about it that way? I want us to look at, at uh, uh, Ezra now as we consider this hand of God. And we're going to see some things in Ezra that help us uh, to see this idea, the hand of God, but in a slightly different way. Uh, look at the next slide. This is the one that I said, okay, read Ezra 8. That was your homework last week. I should have told you, read Ezra 7 and 8. Because as I did more studying, there's as much in chapter 7 as there is in chapter 8. Now most of us know what's going on here, don't we? 
What's going on here is Ezra, who was a scribe, you say, what's a scribe? I don't use that word in uh, 2018 in Hong Kong. A scribe was someone who was an expert in the law, who st the law of God. And uh, the law of God would have been Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's always amazing to me that they found such inspiration in the first five books of the Bible. Amazing, isn't it? Me, I get inspired by Psalms. I get inspired by the New Testament. But they were inspired by those first five books, the law of the Lord, and they loved it. And they meditated on it. That's what David, that's what David says as well. So he was an expert in the law. He knew the word of God. So that's what Ezra was. Where is he? He's not in Jerusalem. He's in Babylon. His ancestor, and maybe he himself, probably not because he's not an old, old man, but they have been, they were taken as prisoners of war from Jerusalem because they had sinned, they had fallen away from God, they, in their independence from God, became subject to their enemy. Brothers and sisters, get that in your hearts and in your thoughts. When we declare our independence from God and His ways and His word, we will become subject to the enemy. There's no way around it. There's no way around it. Very, very clear. And they had become subject to the enemy in Babylon. Oh, far from God, far from their land. No temple there, no this, no that. And then God moved the heart of the king and, he, and Ezra found favor some of them had already gone back to Jerusalem. They had gone back and they had begun to rebuild the land. Uh, when I first went to China in 1986, a long time ago, Keith was there before I was even, even longer. We've been friends a long, long time. And we, uh, even then, in the mid-80s in China, they would talk about what? Build the country, Jian Guo build the country. Now, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's what the, the, that's what the, the refugees, if you will, that's what they had done. They had then gone back to their country and they had begun to build their home, rebuild their homes, rebuild the city of Jerusalem. They rebuilt the altar. They rebuilt the temple. The problem was there were not priests and Levites who knew the word of the Lord so that they could instruct the people in the ways of the Lord. And so God moved Ezra and others go back so that these people who have gone back to the land may know me, may know my ways, may obey, and then live in my grace and live in my blessing. And so that's where Ezra is. God was so good that not only did God say to this former prisoner of war, you may go back to Jerusalem, he also took all of the gold and the silver from the treasury that had been taken from the temple of God, and he gave it to Ezra and the people that were with him. And he said, here, take this gold, take this silver. Hey, what work of God is there to take a pagan king, move his heart, that he would give up gold and silver and give it to another, give it to a, a foreign god, give it to a god, the God of heaven that he doesn't know. Hey, God can do anything. God can do anything. And so he gives back to Ezra and those who are going with him the gold and the silver and many things that by today's standards would be millions and millions of dollars, millions of dollars because it was tons of gold, it was tons of silver. And they had to get from Babylon all the way back to Jerusalem. How many miles? About 900. About 900 miles. With big carts and this and that, no. Maybe a few horses, but with carts and carrying it themselves. With soldiers and weaponry and this and that, no. None of that. None of that. And so what does Ezra do? What happens? He prays and he proclaims a fast. They humble themselves so that God would give them a safe journey. And then he says, I was just ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road. Because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is for good on all who seek him. They had, Ezra had stepped out in faith on a branch. He had stepped out in faith, but it was true, wasn't it? 
it was true, and Ezra and the band met the conditions for the hand of God to be upon them. They met the conditions. They humbled themselves. An independent spirit would have said this. Follow me. Follow with me. Huh. The king gave us gold. The king gave us all the silver. The king is releasing us and letting us return. It would be a small thing to say, Oh king, would you give us some horses and some soldiers and some weapons to protect us all the way back to Jerusalem? Do you think the king would have done that? I think the king would have done that. I do. He was already doing so much. But they didn't do that. That's what the independent spirit would say. But they didn't have an independent spirit, did they? What did they have instead? A humble spirit. And the humble spirit depends on God. And the humble spirit says, Oh God, you protect us. You protect us. Brothers and sisters, here's a, lesson, here's a big lesson for us. A big lesson for us. The independent heart, the proud heart says, I'm going to handle this. I'm going to do it my way. It is the dependent heart and the humble heart that says, Oh God, I'm going to give it up to you and I'm going to let you work this out. God, I ask you. I, God, I ask you. I'm going to tell you something this morning. When you and I humble ourselves under God's hand, He will never fail us. He will never leave you hanging out to dry on your own. Ha! Fooled you. That's not the God that we serve. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Now some of you this morning have some questions because you're going through some tough times and you've been going through some tough times. You're going to say, yeah, but I've asked God to help. And we're going to get to that. We may not get to that this morning. I promise you we'll get to it the next time we come back to this because there's some things that can help us as we look at this. But as we look here at Ezra, we see this hand of God. We see this hand of God. They humble themselves um, under under the hand of God. And now I want us to look at a few other things in Ezra 7 and 8. So you may have your electronic Bibles or you may have your paper Bibles with you. We're going to kind of go through some of these things quickly. Look with me. Let's go back to uh, chapter 7 because Ezra says a lot about the hand of God. So I've already said it's a good place to be under the hand of God. It's not, it's not just uh, this hand that pushes, but it's a hand of God. And look at chapter 7, verse 6. The king had granted him, Ezra, everything he'd asked for, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. And I want you to see something here right now. Because of the hand of God, there was favor that was given to Ezra in his request. Now I want you to understand with me, because I'm not preaching, Oh, favor, I proclaim favor to you. Brothers and sisters, it takes more than a proclamation of favor to receive the favor of God. It takes more than a proclamation. We position ourselves through many things in these ways to receive the favor of the Lord. And here Ezra 7 and 8 are good examples for us. And so here's this first example. Then what comes next? The next one, Ezra uh, verses 8 through 10. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem... Um, in the fifth month of the seventh year, you say, when is the fifth month of the seventh year? That's in August, early August sometime. Why? For the gracious hand of his God was on him. I want to ask you something this morning. Are you facing something ahead that you look at and, and you almost dread it or you're a little bit scared about it? You think, God, I think I believe this is you, but God, how am I going to get from here to there? How am I going to make it? How am I going to make it through? How am I going to do what I think you've called me to do? How is this going to be? You've put something in my heart, but God, how is it going to be? Learn a lesson from Ezra, who had the gracious hand of God on him. Now, here is the physical example of, of, of the hand of God in a journey. It was a physical journey, but brothers, there's a spirit, brothers and sisters, there's a spiritual reality here. It's not just a physical journey. There are things that God has called us to and through a process of things that if God's hand is upon us, we meet the conditions. We've humbled ourselves under His hand. He'll see us through. You will make it through. You think you won't. And you won't in your own resources. But you will under God's hand. If you keep yourself under God's hand. You keep yourself under His gracious hand. 
And then look at the next one. What comes next in verses 27 and 28? Still in chapter 7. He says, praise God. Oh, I really like this one. He has put it into the king's heart to bring honor to the house of the Lord. He's extended his good favor to me before the king and his advisors and all the king's powerful officials because the hand of the Lord my God was on me. I took courage and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. Here's a wonderful encouragement for you and for me as well. You want the favor of the Lord in your life? You're in a work situation or a personal or whatever the situation is. If you will humble yourself consistently, not just one. Oh God, I humble myself. We uh, honestly, you folks, we sometimes kind uh, now you're laughing because you know that's true. Yes. True for me too as well. What we're talking about is a life that's under, that's under the hand of God. And you will see and I will see the favor of God. God will work in others that you cannot control, that are more powerful than you, that have control over your lives and situations and all of these ways, but because you are under God's hand, He'll take care of them. He'll bring favor into your life because of what He can do. You submit to God. You say, I'm not going to work this out myself. I'm not going to, hoo, hoo, hoo. no God, I humble myself before you. And what you do and what comes from your hand, I accept it. I take it. God is the one who brings favor. We work so hard to bring favor ourselves. We work so hard to promote ourselves. We work so hard to be top of the heap. By the way, if you think I'm preaching hard this morning, I'm preaching to myself as well. I'm preaching to myself as well. But under God's hand is where we find favor. It's where we find favor. Amen. 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 Look at Ezra chapter 8. Look at verses 15 through 8. And by the way, sorry. So that one right there, because of God's hand upon me, I took courage. Oh, under the hand of the Lord, you can be in a frightful, dreadful situation, but you will find courage with the hand of the Lord upon you. You'll make it through. Why? Because you're so strong? No! It's God's hand. And it's a mighty hand. It's a mighty hand. And you can take courage in the mighty hand of God. Chapter 8, verses 15 through 18. I, I like this one as well, and I encourage you to go back and read. They gathered by the Ahava Canal. They were getting ready to go back, and Ezra found something. He found out that as he counted all of the men and the families to go back to Jerusalem, that there weren't enough Levites and temple servants to do what, God, what they had to do for the, for the temple back there. There weren't enough people. Now, look at what it says. So he sent them to Ido. Don't name your son Ido. <laughs> Maybe we'll meet Ido in heaven one day. <laughs> But the, but the Bible says that in heaven we're given a new name. <laughs> I like that. So, Ido, um, it sounds a little bit too close to idiot, doesn't it? I don't know. <laughs> but um, I, I want you to, I want you to, to see this. And I, I really like the, uh, I like that this is included here. It says, I told them what to say so that they might bring attendance to us for the house of our God. Because the gracious hand of our God was on us, they brought us Sherebiah, a capable man, and others as well. Have you ever been in a situation where that requires delicacy, diplomacy, and tact? Yeah? Something has to be handled. How are you going to do it? This is a situation that required delicacy, diplomacy, and tact. How did he get worked out? How was it resolved? Because he was humbled under the hand of God. God worked it out successfully. God worked it out successfully. I, I like that one. I like that one. Then uh, we go to the next one, 822. This one we've already looked at, right? This is the one, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks, and God took care of him. Millions of dollars. I, I said in the first service, I was reading something in South China Morning Post. They've changed some of the, uh, uh, they've changed some of the laws regarding money withdrawals from ATMs in Macau. Have you all read about that? And what they have found is, as they've made some changes, you know, all the casinos and stuff, as they've made changes there, there are now suspicious large money withdrawals from ATMs in Hong Kong. 
And what they said was, what they're finding is that when sometimes large money withdrawals are being made, these people are being robbed. Now, I'm sure that doesn't show up a lot in the newspapers. I just read something about it. And I was thinking about that. Let me ask you something. How many of you, if you were walking, not in your car, and let's say late at night, because you know they had to get from Babylon all the way to Jerusalem, right? So it wasn't down Nathan Road or, or Canton Road or Queens Road Central um, in broad daylight with all the policemen around. It was 900 miles through valleys, through difficult places where there were bandits and plenty of enemy. It was, it was a, a lawless path. It was a lawless road. How many of you would be very comfortable late at night with hundreds of thousands of Hong Kong dollars in your backpack or on your purse. You would be very, very comfortable to walk around Wan Chai by yourself without any protection or uh, say around Temple Street or Mong Kok area late, late, late at night. Happy to? I think not. <laughs> Maybe some of you say, ha, no problem. Not I. <laughs> not I. But that's, that's, the, that's the picture that we have here and we see God's hand of protection. We see God's hand of protection. I, I remember one time a few years ago, um, I was withdrawing some money from, from a bank in Taipo. This is many years ago now. And for some reason, I was, I was uneasy. I, don't, I, I never get uneasy. Hong Kong, I believe, is, is truly one of the safest big cities in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I was a little bit uncomfortable. And I, and I didn't know why. It was broad daylight and it's typo. I'm a typo girl, you know? I'm, I, I am. And I believe it was the Holy Spirit. And I looked and there was a man just kind of loitering around. I thought, huh. And so I walked a little bit down the street. I hadn't gone into the bank yet. And he sort of followed me around. Then I came back and he sort of waited there a little bit longer. Then I went in. I started to go in the bank and he kind of got closer to the door and I thought, this man is targeting me. This man, and so I walked away. I didn't go into the bank. I believe that was the Holy Spirit that protected me. Absolutely, I believe it was. Not that I have a huge, not that I have millions of dollars to withdraw from the bank. <laughs> I don't. But that's just a, that's just a, a, a physical example of the hand of God protecting us. Honestly, brothers and sisters, I believe there are far more times in our lives when we need the spiritual protection of the Lord. Don't you think so? We, really, we need the spiritual protection of the Lord. And so we see this here. I'll go a little bit further. Uh, one more time. Ezra chapter 8, verse 31. On the twelfth day of the first month, that was uh, April... Eight or nine. That's that in, in modern in modern calendar days. We set out from the Ahava Canal to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and He protected us from enemies and bandits along the way. Brothers and sisters, there's no safer place to be than under the hand, humbled under the hand of God. Is that not true? Is that not true? It's not a place of push. It's not a place of. Oh, this is hard. It is the best place that we can be. And I want you to see one other thing. We're going to look at one other main point this morning. But I want you to see one thing before we look at the main point. I want you to see something here in these two verses. And you'll see it in the chapter 7 as well. What type of hand is described here? Look at, look at this passage. What does it say? What does it say here? Gracious hand. We often don't think of the hand of God in that way. What does gracious hand mean? What's the root of the word gracious? What is it? Grace. 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 God's hand is a hand of grace on our lives. Do we see that? It's a hand of grace. It's a hand of grace. That's why James says he gives us extra grace. That's why Peter says he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Because it's a hand of grace. It's a hand of grace. Now, last main thing, and we'll come to a close. We'll come to a close this morning. Um, we talked about this being the humbling, a voluntary humbling when, through fasting. We choose to do that. Tithing, 
and giving, we choose to do that. Prayer, we choose to do that. And these are things we'll talk about further. But I want to come to something that's even perhaps more mundane and, more, and, and simpler than that, if you will. And we see it in the life of Ezra. Because we, you know, how many of us, how many of you just love to study Ezra, this Old Testament guy? We kind of ignore him, don't we? You know, he's way back there, old, dry, and dusty. And I want to show you something this morning from the life of Ezra that will help you if you are saying this morning, this is speaking to my heart. I want to take this in. I want this to be my life. And I'm going to show you something. First of all, look at what James says. James says, next slide, he says, God opposes the proud. We know this part. And then look at what James says. A little bit different from Peter, but it's all in the same vein. James says, submit yourselves Humble yourselves before the Lord. This is all part of the same package. And I want us to look at one word here and then at Ezra, and it will help us see this morning how this fits with our lives. What is the root meaning? When you think of the word submit, what do you think of? What is the meaning? What is it, how does it relate to us? The root meaning of the word submit is very, very simply obey. Mm. You mean I don't have to wait till a special time of fasting and prayer to humble myself? <sighs> every day, every hour, we have a chance to humble ourselves and to submit. Submit, very simply, root meaning, obey. Obey. God gives us the choice. That's why it's voluntary, right? We choose. That's why God put the, gar put the tree in the garden, so that Adam and Eve could choose. Not, you must serve me, you must submit to me, you must be humble under me. I give you a choice. He gives us a choice, brothers and sisters. He gives us a choice. And so we submit ourselves to God. We obey. And some of us this morning, we kind of think, well, I'm not sin I'm, I'm, I haven't cheated on my husband or wife. I haven't robbed a bank. I haven't stabbed anybody. I haven't done these things. May I say to you this morning, I think we're a pretty good bunch. You know, I look at us as I look at it. I, I, I think it's much more subtle and much deeper than that. I think God's after our hearts, brothers and sisters, because I think there are all sorts of things that go in our heart, go on in our hearts that nobody ever sees. And it has to do with attitudes. And it has to do with anger. And it has to do with pride. And it has to do with unforgiveness. And it has to do with grudges. And it has to do with offenses and hurts that we are holding on to and we refuse to give them up because they haven't said sorry to me yet. We have a choice. Now how does that fit with Ezra? Ezra 7, 8 through 10. What type of man was Ezra as we come to a close this morning? Ba, 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 ba. Verse 10. Most of you use NIV. We're going to look at NIV and then we're going to close with ESV. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and law in Israel. Look at that very, very carefully. Most of you use NIV, I think, or maybe New Living Translation. And I think it loses something with NIV. We don't really get the, the, the exact picture. Look at the next, uh, click the next one, which is the ESV. It's an exact, uh, exact. For Ezra had set his heart. He had determined to study. Do you know what the word study means? Here you get, here, here you get it. Do you know what it actually, the, the, the idea of it is? to seek the law of the Lord, to inquire after, to find out about. Brothers and sisters, here's something about Ezra. Here's what we need to see about the life of Ezra. Do we think that Ezra fasted a few days by the Ahava Canal and because of that, woo, he had the favor of the Lord in all of these areas of his life? No. It is a life of humbling. It is a life of submitting. It is a life of obedience. And Ezra had set his heart, I am going to, I'm going to, God, what does your word say? God, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? What, not, not, oh, there, read my three chapters for today, huh? Read my ten chapters for today, or whatever it is. There, I've done it. Gone to church Sunday morning, gone to Bible study there, over and done with. That's not what it means. That's not a life of submitting. That's not a life of obedience. It may include those things, but God's after our hearts. 
He's after our hearts. And it's the heart that is submitted. It's the heart that's saying, God, I'm going after you. God, what does your word say? And God, when your word says it, when I understand it, when your Holy Spirit breathes life into it and illuminates it, then, Lord, I'm not just going to have it up here. We all have it up here. We get the teaching of the word at Lighthouse. We've got it up here. We know so much. It's running out of our ears up here. It takes more than that. And he set his heart to seek the, the law of the Lord. Oh God, what are you saying? And then what? To do it. To obey it. To put it into practice in lives. That's the life of submitting. That's the life of humbling. That's the life of obeying. God, I'm going to do it. It's hard. I'm going to do it. God, I don't want to give this up. They wronged me. You think I don't struggle with that in my heart? I'm human too. I struggle with that. Just the same as you. But brothers and sisters, I am determining. I'm setting my heart. God, what does your word say? And Holy Spirit, when I understand, I, I don't care if it hurts and I don't care if it, it's hard. I want to do it. I want to obey it. Because I want your grace poured out in my life. I want to be humbled. I want to, you say obey, I want to, I want to obey. Sometimes I'm angry about things. Sometimes I'm angry at people. And you are too. And I don't want to let it go. Do you want to let it go? I think they're wrong. They did this to me. They said this to me. They said this about me. And my brain just goes over and over and over. And God the Holy Spirit, when I come to His Word, says, Jennifer, you give that up. You're going to go to sleep with that in your heart. My Word says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. I'm going to obey. Now that's just one example. That's just one example. We all have these areas. But we want a life of grace. Do we not? Do you? Do we want a life of favor? It takes more than a proclamation. It takes more than one little prayer. I I'm not mocking. Please understand that. I mean this well up with all my heart. I have prayed through this and I'm praying through this myself. I can't preach to you something that's God that, that I'm not willing to do in my own life or else it's hypocrisy. And then I'm really in trouble. We want to live a life of God's favor. It takes more than proclamation. It takes more than one week of fasting and prayer. It's a life. Under the gracious hand of God. But that's what I want. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what we want? I ask you right now. A few minutes passed. But I don't want you. Don't start. I'm going to ask you right now. Just close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. Because He deals with each one of us in different ways. Just, just close your eyes. And you can do it quietly. Any way you want to. And I just want you to ask the same question that I'm asking and have been asking, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me this morning? Would you ask Him that? It's not about me. It's not about, oh, well, you can't tell me to whatever. No, I'm, I'm giving us an opportunity. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Holy Spirit, and it may be, there may be something in His Word that He's, gonna, he's speaking to you right now and you, and you know, you know it. And you've been holding on to it. And you didn't want to give it up because it brought you satisfaction or whatever and holding on to it because you're right and, and they're wrong and this is the way it should be. But you don't want God opposing you. You want the grace of God. Is it hard? Yes, it's hard. But here's your great God who says, if you will choose, I will give you grace right now. And a little bit later, and tomorrow, and any time it comes back and tries to grab your heart again, if you will say, no God, no God, I choose you, I choose you, I obey, I obey, I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you grace. And you will live in victory. And you will live in the favor of God this year. We pray. 
we ask, we beg and plead as we submit and humble ourselves under your mighty hand, under your gracious hand, under your hand of protection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I encourage you this week. <laughs>